I'm here to introduce to you today the film Wild Strawberries. It premiered in 1957, and this film, along with The Seventh Seal, were the first two films that many here in America saw of Ingmar Bergman, and they were the films that really paved his way to international success. This film was set in 1950 Sweden, and it's about an old man, Isak Bori, and about his rediscovery of, of himself. The film takes place over the course of a single day, and yet despite the fact that it's just one day that the film is, is showing, uh, it's much more fragmentary than that. It's made up of memories and of dreams, and because of that, a lot of students find this film perhaps a little bit challenging. But if you keep in mind that the film is really about Isak and about the character of Isak, it should make a lot more sense. One of the things that Bergman is doing in this film is he's trying to visually show what, how he understands modern subjectivity. That the modern subject is made up of bits and pieces of fragments of the past that um, don't always mean something initially but sometimes come back later to mean something quite significant. And so it's, it's a way of visually stitching these things together. And the cinematic term, suture, um, certainly is applicable here, um, especially in certain scenes where you see how the camera actually uh, brings places and people together uh, to create new kinds of meaning. Isak Bori's name is significant. Uh, the word Bori in Swedish means a stronghold or a fortress. And Isak would like to present this kind of facade to the world, uh, that he has this kind of um, impenetrable self uh, that, that can't be affected and can't be changed by, by others around him or by circumstances. But it's this, this desire to isolate himself that is leading to the crisis that, that we see unfolding here in the film. And what really takes place over the course of the film is that he begins to understand um, the impossibility of this objective and rational position. And by the end of the film, he's beginning to recognize something quite different. And perhaps one of the most significant lines of the film is uh, something that Isak says um, a little bit later on when he says to his traveling companions, Tak for Selskopeter, thank you for the company, um, that this is uh, perhaps one of the most significant things for him in the end. In many of Bergman's films, uh, you see the portrayal of, of a kind of psychology. He's very interested in psychology and in how uh, the self thinks of itself and um, understands itself. A lot of people see Bergman's films as being um, semi-autobiographic in that they seem to be saying much more about Bergman than they are about anything else. In this case, the position that Bergman seems to be critiquing is this idea of a position that can understand everything, uh, that can stand outside and not be affected, uh, the self that doesn't change. Um, and for Isak, uh, what he has to come to terms with is how he is changing and needs to change. And it's his willingness to open himself up to others um, that's, the, that's going to be the crucial insight that he needs to learn. An important cultural reference that, uh, that one might miss if one doesn't speak Swedish or isn't familiar with Swedish culture is that of the, the wild strawberry, or um, as the title might more literally be translated, the wild strawberry patch. Uh, the name in Swedish is Smultronstället, and for a, a native Swede, this idea of the wild strawberry patch um, is significant. It's a place that um, has to do with intimacy. It's a private place, um, kind of maybe like a uh, a fishing hole that, that you know about, that you wouldn't tell just anyone about. Uh, they would associate it with nature, uh, with childhood, and with those magical summer nights in Sweden that seem to go on forever. This is the, it's the wild strawberry patch that triggers the memories for Isak Bori. The wild strawberry patch for him works um, much like the Madeleine in, in Proust writings, that brings back these, these memories um, uncontrollably and that it's these memories that he has and the dreams that he has in association with them that leads to, the, leads to his change. Uh, Bergman does quite a good job of creating a dream-like feeling in some of these sequences. Uh, there's a certain un unnerving uneasiness uh, to some of them, um, and you, you really get that, uh, particularly in the scene where, uh, where Isak Bori is examined. One of the last things I'd like to point out to you is a historical reference that, uh, that might elude many of you. The main character, Isak Bori, is played by the actor Victor Hrustrom. Uh, Victor Hrustrom was, uh, of course, an actor, but he was also a director, and he was probably the, the best-known, most prominent director from 
Sweden's silent age of film. It was kind of a golden age of filmmaking in Scandinavia before sound came. And uh, Victor Schuström was by far uh, the, uh, the greatest star. This is one of his last roles that he, that he played. And the film itself is interesting in how it quotes some of his work as a director. Particularly if you take the one of the, one of the first dream sequences where Isaac Bori is wandering around on the street. He looks up at the clock with, uh, with no hands. And there's a funerary cart that, that comes down the street, a, a cart carrying a, a coffin. Uh, this, this scene with the, the cart and the coffin is almost a direct quote from his film, uh, The Phantom Carriage, uh, from 1921, what a lot of people consider to be the, the real high point of the, of the silent era in Sweden. Uh, when you think about this, you think about um, how audacious it is for Bergman to take Schuström, who in, in, every, in every account is his cinematic father, and to literally kill off the father in the way he does by putting Isak Bori in the, in the coffin. Um, it's, it's really quite pretentious in a lot of, in a lot of ways.